Hey guys, welcome back to the online event series, Catholic and Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing. My name is Elise, I'm the organizer and fellow panelist. This is the Q&A video section with my very, very good friends, Rebecca and Udi. Um, they are soft-hearted friends of mine and I'm so excited to do this with them. They are um, meeting for the first time through this project. So, okay guys, let's kick this off. For question one, it comes from uh, a person who um, we'll refer to as anonymous because they do not want to disclose their name. Um, Udi, this is a question from anonymous. Uh, how do I aggressively and support and speak out against racism, witnessing police brutality and so much hate and not allow the hate to penetrate my heart while I fight against it? Yeah, so I've been reflecting on this question a lot the past week. Um, and funny enough, um, during my church's sermon this morning, they shared the story of Ruby Bridges, um, who was the little elementary girl uh, who was the first one to um, desegregate school. Um, and the story there was about how um, every day when she walked through those crowds of adults who were threatening to kill her um, and all of these terrible things, um, she would pray for them. And um, it was actually an interview with the school, I think counselor or psychiatrist, um, but he um, was watching for Ruby to um, step in whenever he noticed signs of, um, you know, trouble or like being a troubled kid. Um, and she never developed those signs. And when he spoke with her, it's because, you know, she really felt like in her heart that these people need to, needed prayer. Um, and she really felt like in her heart that these people were made in the image of God. Um, and I think um, hearing that was really humbling for myself because I think I'm the type of person who can easily give in to hate um, can, and I can easily um, look at a person with a different opinion from me as the other. Um, and so I think when I answer this question, I'm making a lot of presumptions about the person who's asking it. Um, but for myself, I think um, because I can be so easily blinded by hate, I really need to anchor myself in um, the core values that I hold as a person um, and how I want to treat other people. And that is, you know, um, the belief that all humans are made in the image of God. And because of that, all humans are inherently valuable. Um, I also um, believe that um, any cause that I want to fight for um, needs to be um, fought for in love. Um, and I think hate can really distort um, the overarching goal that a person might have. Um, and then I think lastly too, um, I think forgiveness is a huge thing for me. Um, and I think in, um, I think especially, in, actually, <laughs> I think forgiveness can be such a radical idea um, and it can be very challenging for people, um, especially when you want to consider like accountability and justice. Um, I think for a lot of people, the idea of forgiving someone who's wronged you or forgiving someone who is just so cruel and brutal um, doesn't seem right. Um, but I know, um, just based on my understanding of the Bible and of who God is, is that forgiveness must happen. Um, not just because like we were also forgiven as people, but I think healing really does begin um, when you forgive people. And so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Udi. Um, you know, this is, I like, I've always known you as such a, such a humble and brave person. And thank you so much for speaking from the heart to this person that neither of us know. <laughs> um, I don't even know what it is. It's a pre-submitted question by somebody who saw the form for the project. And um, yeah, thank you. That, yeah, I think a lot of people can really identify with what you're saying, that um, anger can really eat a person up and also like change the direction of things in ways that become unpredictable or, unintended um 
So yeah, thank you for that. Um, the next question is also from who we will call anonymous. Um, and the question is for Rebecca. Uh, the question says, I am a 60 year old woman from the South. I grew up in segregation and I hated it. My awkward question is, why am I immediately suspect by black people? That's a good question. And I think when I was reflecting on that question, um, I also had to, I had to think of like what resources are out there, or like where, where, I guess like where did that come from? Like why, why did you, why do you, why did, why have you always like been immediately su suspect by black people? And um, yeah, as I've been like learning and growing about like America's like history, um, like I've just watched and like taken advantage of all the like resources that have been out here, out there, uh, um, especially with um, just the second like flow of like Black Lives Matter right now. Um, so I was watching like a couple weeks ago, the 13th on Netflix. Um, and like, even though it's about, um, um, oh my gosh, can't remember the word, incarceration, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, like they, it talked a lot about like the history and there was like um, a part of, there was a part where they were talking about like an election, a presidential election, and they had said that like one commercial that they used, um, they like used a black man's face to portray a criminal. And then like, since then, like it, like it, like in people's mind, it like associated like a black person's face or like a, a black person at, like related to like criminal, criminal crimes sorry and so I just think like that's been yeah I think that's been taught it's been taught in television and the news and how we talk um the people around you I've never been in the south um or like lived there really um and I don't know if it's good to assume that or like if it's the right to assume that like that's still like that's that was a part of like that was a big part of like culture there um but yeah I think to answer the question like it's just something that's been taught and like reinforced and I think um yeah I wonder like why anonymous said it's an awkward question um but it's good to like realize that and um and it's, and like you have to realize that it's, yeah, like that's, that's like a, the messaging that's been portrayed. Um, and so I think just like when you notice that in yourself, or like at least, like, I mean, I, I even though I, I, I mean, I live in America as well. So like, I've noticed that too. And I've noticed that bias in myself. And like, there are times like, I have to think to myself like well I like I have to de deconstruct like why I was thinking that way and um, yeah and just like continue to like practice a new way of thinking basically so I hope that answered the question <laughs> Rebecca thanks so much for sharing from your heart um, yeah, these are hard questions and the best that we can do is one person at a time, right? Just talking with one another. And um, when there's a lot of conflict and tension in the culture, that's where we start is just one at a time. Um, so I have a couple questions as well. Um, the question that I'll, that I'll be answering today is, I'm a six year old woman from the South. I grew up in segregation and I hated it. I am very aware that everyone has implicit bias, including me. When I see that in myself, I work on it internally. What can I do better? And what actionable goals and tasks can we actually strive to accomplish? So, um, you know, given that I don't know who this person is, 
I, I want to start off by saying thank you for your intention. Um, it's hard to say what someone can do better without knowing them. And that may be reflective of my professional background. Um, so, you know, as part of this project, um, I, I, everyone knows that I'm a therapist, um, but as part of keeping my friends and the panelists uh, privacy safe in terms of their um, actual physical safety, um, we're not disclosing any of anyone else's professional backgrounds in this project. So um, they're, they're participating as experts of their own narratives. So, you know, so I'm coming from like, uh, first how your question strikes me, but also with my professional background. And, um, and so I, I'm, I'm one to lean on the side of individually looking at people. What I can say is that in these times, people are generally fearful of being imperfect, whether it's the perfect thoughts or the perfect words or the perfect behavior. I think it's safe to say, or fair to say, reasonably, that we, we the, the royal we for all of us, we know what violence looks like, physical violence, regardless of what it's motivated by. For the person who asks this question, it sounds to me like they aren't really struggling with the extreme behaviors of racial violence. For those who struggle with having perfect behavior and perfect thoughts, which my, my suspicion is that the person asking this question may be struggling more with the perfect thoughts aspect, um, my first suggestion is to break the ice with humility by offering a confession on the imperfect thoughts and to do it within the relationships that are core to you with those who love you. Because in love, there is room for a natural offering of grace. Grace is different from evasion and fear, which avoids dealing with the truth. Grace has the ability to forgive, but also to redeem. So the forgiveness and redemption process only begins with confession, or what we, or through Christian circles, we call it repentance. And when you start in humility, you also model this for others, um, and they can follow suit. Humility is a sweet fragrance or a sweet seed to soften difficult and challenging topics, as well as difficult and challenging personalities and difficult and challenging feelings that exist in others. Many people these days in the tension of our cultural climate are feeling difficult and challenging feelings. When we practice truthful and humble speech with those who are core to us, we can grow together, grow stronger together in truth, not in fear or evasion or avoidance or making excuses, but in truth, and then extending the model to others who are close to us but not core, until gradually as we go outwards in our social circles, we can model it and grow for those who are not in our immediate vicinity. So in conclusion, what I'm describing is after working on yourself all these years, being a 60 year old woman, seeing deep seated hatred and racial violence where you were, and if it wasn't physical violence, then maybe it was redlining in, in real estate. Maybe it was the financial practices. Maybe it was the, the school system. Um, whatever it was, you identified yourself as having grown up in, seg in the segregated South, that you did not like it, that you've, that you've clearly done a lot of work over these years. And I wanna encourage you. I feel like you're in a prime position to help others grow by being a soft teacher or moderator for your friends, family, and neighbors. And you can help your community grow in your corner of the world. So whoever you are, Anonymous, I'm excited for you. I think you can have really great conversations. And if you do end up having them, I would love to hear about them <laughs> if you would like to share about them um, and how it goes for you. So all that said, um, at this moment, I just want to share the share the whole um, share with the whole table. So with Rebecca and Udi, if you have any thoughts with the other questions and answers that were had, if you have further reflections, you're more than welcome to chime in too. Yeah, I was thinking about my question again, and I was just rereading it just to make sure I was understanding what she was asking. Um, because she said my awkward question, and 
is why am I immediately suspect by black people? So I'm just wondering if you guys are interpreting it like she's like black people are suspect of her or the opposite? Because I think I answered it the opposite way. Yeah, I, I mean, I have a couple of thoughts, but what, do you, what about you? What do you think? I, I interpreted it as the other way. Um, I think it would be more clarifying if we knew um, the race of the person who's asking this question. Um, but the way that it's worded, I interpreted it as being suspect by Black people, or like Black people are suspecting her. Um, that's how I interpreted it. Yeah, um, you know, I don't know either. So I, I made this form so that people who are afraid to ask questions or feeling uncomfortable having conversations in the, in the current climate of culture could pre-submit some questions for our panel. And um, especially if they're afraid to say it to their own friends. So I don't even know who this person is, to be honest with you. I might know who it is, but I actually don't really know who it is because there's no last name. So, you know, like, yeah. it's up for grabs. And um, it's interesting because, you know, like we can interpret this so many ways, right? Like if this is a person who is in that classical white, white black framework of the segregated South, and if she's white and she's suspect by black people, that has certain connotations. If she is black and in, or if she's like um, an African-American first generation immigrant, and if she's like suspect by black people, that has new connotations. Yeah. If she's a person of color who's white passing, like biracial or multi-ethnic or whatever, white passing, and, and then she's, suspe she's suspect by black people, that has another connotation. If she's, um, you know, there's all these different possibilities. Yeah. If she's, um, maybe she's black, but then is she also like, was she adopted? Was she biracial? Like, was she um, foster in a foster family? Was she like with her birth family? Who was she raised by? And what role did that did the family members have in the community? Um, you know, what are the relationships? What what causes the feelings of um, People must be suspect of me. Yeah. Suspect about me. Um, are these founded on real, like tangible things, or is it like microaggressions, or is it paranoia? Like, there's so many things, so many possibilities. So I, I feel like I can't really. I don't know. You have a <laughs> question, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, how, how do you feel with like, you know, as you're reflecting on that question and some of Woody's thoughts and my thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think I answered it. I think, yeah, you're both, there's just so many things that are not, like I don't know, so, about the question and who asked it, so. Um, but yeah, I think like the answer I gave is like, as much as I can give at this time. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah, I, I mean, I feel like you spoke from your heart and the way that I've known you the last several years of being friends, um, you're so thoughtful. So thank you. Thank you for, for thinking of like multiple angles on this, on this question. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, are there, are there any other thoughts that you have about these pre-submitted questions, you guys? Um, I also wanted to add on to, um, for the question about implicit bias. Um, for the woman who submitted that, I think my immediate thought was, good for you that you are 60 years old and you are being mindful of the ways um, that your implicit bias comes out. Because I think at that age, so many people are just like, you know what, I've lived through life, I've paid my dues, I'm just gonna be stuck in my ways and continue living this way, right? Um, and I've, I've, in, I've encountered and met and worked with so many people who are at that age and they just refuse, you know, to see life any other way. So again, just, Thank you so much for continuing to be open-minded and wanting to continue to 
work um, just yourself and your character um, so that you can love people for who they are and not the way that your brain is wired to view them. Um, and so with that, I think too, like, it's important to remember that our brains will like to take shortcuts in anything that it can. And that also includes the way that they, that our brain views people. And so I think when it comes to things like implicit bias, um, it's just something that our brains have been wired to think throughout our lives, whether it's, you know, the way that we grew up, the people that we surround ourselves with, the messages that the media we take in throws at us. Um, and so it's, it's a lot of effort and a lot of work to really confront um, the preset, you know, ideas and concepts that we have of people and of um, different races. Um, but I think even the fact that you asked this question um, is a great first step in working towards that. So thank you. <laughs> That is so beautiful. Thanks, Udi. You know, as you were saying those things, I was reminded of, um, I think some of my toughest race-related race conversations happened during grad school, like a long time ago. And um, in grad school, most of my colleagues and peers were in their like second career. Um, they have, like a lot of them were middle-aged or beyond middle-aged, retired even and um coming back into the field to do what they what felt they were always called to do but you know counseling and ministry <laughs> you can't always support a family on that so anyhow for whatever reason that people had to not pursue it before um they came back and said they were working on their degrees so um a lot of my friends my best friends from that time were in their 40s and 50s and some even in their 60s and um that potential for change, even for those who are older, was so evident to me in that time because um, some of my best friends like never really had exposure to Asian people, whether they're white or black, um, ended up becoming my best friends, became, becoming like, one of them became like a second mom to me. And, um, you know, like all that change that happened was in the, in the place of relationship through friendship and developing love for each other. It was like my friend, you know, the one that became like a second mom, she's like, you're my friend and I'm not going to let people treat you badly. And <laughs> like, I'll go there for you wherever that, you know, wherever you need me to be. And you just tell me and I'm going to show up. And like, you know, like she was so, she's so sweet. And um, like to this day, we're so close. And she's like, well, this is what I do for my other friends. Why not? You know, like, of course it's going to carry over for you too. So like in that context, um, change was in love was very natural and very, very easy. Um, I mean, not, I don't know if easy is the right word, but it was, it was natural. It was organic and, um, it wasn't forced. So, um, yeah, I, I just want to echo what you said. Thanks for, thanks for what you said, Woody, that encouragement, because it reminded me of a, of a relationship, um, some significant ones. Yeah, so um, yeah, at this point, I'm sorry to cut this panel, panel uh, Q&A short, but as the organizer, I have to play bad cop and keep watch on the time. Thanks so much for your time, you guys, Rebecca and Woody. It was so fun. And I hope that this Q&A was encouraging for those who submitted the questions, for those who are watching, and that maybe it inspires you to start some conversations with the core people in your life, whether you have questions or you want to share something from your own experience or just to make the topic less intimidating or, and more manageable as a talking point. And with that, we wish you all God bless.